right, uh, we're going to continue our teaching on developing a biblical worldview tonight. By what standard? An introduction to Christian ethics. An introduction to Christian ethics. We are in this series learning how to develop a biblical worldview which means that we are training ourselves to see the world, our lives, everything in it through the lens of Scripture. And that would include the current condition of our American culture. It's no surprise to tell you we're living in an America that seems similar in some ways to Israel during the days, the dark days of the prophet Jeremiah uh, when he cried out to the Lord in Jeremiah 12, 1, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy? who deal so treacherously. I found myself asking God that question the last year or two. We are led by leaders who lie to us. They give us taxation without representation. They label patriots as traitors, while they themselves disregard our Constitution. Yet they seem to prosper. They seem to get away with it. They get reelected. It reminds me of the condition of the country under another prophet, the great Isaiah, in chapter 59. He said, we look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth has fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter. One version says honesty cannot enter. So truth falls, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The NLT on that verse says truth is gone, and everyone who, announce, who renounces evil is attacked. If that doesn't sound like what's going on today, I don't know what does. He says, truth is gone and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. Notice in that passage what's missing. Justice, righteousness, truth, honesty, and these are all, have one thing in common, they're all ethical issues. They deal with moral values. Even the world is waking up to the fact that America has a problem with immorality. This is a Gallup poll from two months ago. A record high 50% of Americans rate the overall state of moral values in the U.S. as poor. Another 37% say it's only fair. 78% think our moral values are getting worse. Just 1% think the state of moral values is excellent, and only 12% say they're good. They've been doing this particular survey for 20 years. This is the lowest rating in 20 years of this Gallup poll. Now, the Gallup poll is a secular poll, but the Christian surveys are showing the same thing. The Cultural Research Center survey from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University paints a bleak picture of our nation's radically shifting moral landscape, with Americans no longer looking to biblical truth for moral guidance and increasingly rejecting traditional values that have defined us as a nation since our founding. One of the leaders of that Christian university is Dr. Tracy Munsell, She's the executive director. She says, our nation is facing a potential moral freefall unthinkable 
to earlier generations. With a majority of Americans today no longer embracing values of honesty, respect for the rule of law, the sanctity of life, and traditional sexual morality when facing moral issues. And the scariest section of this recent survey, this Christian survey, is that their research shows that this seismic shift of morality is occurring even among people of faith. Although born-again Christians in the survey were three times as likely to rely on the Bible for primary moral guidance, less than half actually do so. That means that less than half of the Christians surveyed look to the Word of God for guidance on moral issues. Now, I'm old enough to testify that we've seen this happening over the years and getting worse. I never thought I would see politicians who claim to be Christian demanding abortion up to the point of birth. I never thought I'd see professing Christians supporting and voting for pro-abortion candidates. I never thought I'd see Christian churches with Marxist Black Lives Matter flags in front or Christian churches putting gay pride flags in front of their churches. Even so-called Christian denominations now performing same-sex marriage and ordaining homosexuals to the ministry. And the Apostle Paul, in an overlooked scripture, in 1 Corinthians 5, there was a, a man in the church who was in an openly sinful uh, state of living with a woman. Everyone knew about it. And the elders of the church were not dealing with it. So Paul deals with it. And at verse 20, uh, 12, he says, comparing judging those in the church to those outside, he said, what do I have to do with judging those who are outside. Do you not judge those who are inside? And, and, and I meditate on that and think, remember that Paul did not point to the problem of sin in the world, but the problem of sin in the church. Basically what he's saying is sinners sin. It would be very, it's, you know, it's low hanging fruit to stand up here and point out the sins of the world. Now, there's a place for that. But remember, God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because there were so many sinners there. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because there were so few righteous there. So my theme tonight is that this moral meltdown in America tells us too many Christians have no biblical worldview on the subjects of ethics and morality. It's just not taught. And again, I'm not trying to, I'm, I have no one, in, honestly, I have no one particular in mind. I'm just saying, as someone who is called to the ministry and tries to keep up with what's going on in God's church, not just ours, but the church of Jesus Christ in our country, uh, I can say this is true. So now I'd like to do a little teaching on Christian ethics. I think we should always begin defining terms because uh, especially when it comes to ethics and morality because many confuse the two. Now they're similar but they're uh, not the same. And I, I, th I hope you can kind of remember this tonight because it's important. Morality is descriptive. Morality is the study of the way things are. But ethics is normative. It's the study of the way things ought to be. In other words, our, our ethics tell us what we ought to do but our morality is revealed in what we do. And it's important to have the distinction. 
morality is defined by our behavior. We could say a person is moral or immoral based on their behavior. But our, our morality, and, and, and you need to understand this, morality flows out of ethics. We don't have a moral problem. We have an ethical problem. Our ethics or our ethical system informs us as to what, how we ought to behave. The simplest definition of ethics, and you can remember this one, it's from the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. He said, ethics is oughtness. Ethics is oughtness. When you talk about ethics, you're talking about what you ought to do. The formal definition of ethics holds the key for the Christian. It says, ethics are the moral principles that govern a person's behavior. Notice, ethics govern morality. Ethics govern your behavior. You behave according to your ethics. Our ethics determine how we define good and evil, what is morally good and bad, and morally right and wrong. And there we have the great ethical question for every Christian and every culture. How do we define good and evil? How do you know what is good and what is evil? We could give a list of things up here tonight and could ask each one of you to look down the list and say, that's good, that's evil, that's good, that's evil, that's good, or that's right, that's wrong, that's, that's right, that's, that's wrong, or that's wrong, that's right. That, that's what we're talking about when we come to ethics. Now, if you have a biblical worldview, the ethical question about the knowledge of good and evil automatically takes you back to the Garden of Eden And the one thing that God denied mankind, and it was the right to define your ethics. God did not give man the right, the privilege, the freedom to make up his own ethical system. Well, let's put it this way in Genesis 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now remember, the definition of ethics is how we define good and evil. Based on that, and this is so profound, honestly. What we see here in the fall of man is that the issue was an ethical issue. God's whole bone to pick with man was that over ethics. Who has the right to define good and evil? If you read the introductory passages leading up to this verse, you see that God gave man freedom to enjoy all of creation. He said, of all the trees you may freely eat. Imagine God makes this beautiful world and this wonderful paradise of a garden, and he puts the man and the woman in the garden, and he freely gives them permission to partake of all that he made except one thing, the one thing. He would not allow them to establish their own ethics. This so-called forbidden fruit was the knowledge of good and evil. And so when Satan comes on the scene in the next chapter in Genesis 3, that is the target of his attack. In verse 5 he says to the woman, you won't die. God knows in the day you eat of it, this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
And of course, you know they fell for it. And they took the whole human race into a separation from God. But don't miss this important point. The issue was ethical. The whole issue was ethics. And yet how many sermons, how many teachings have you ever heard in your Christian life and ministry and listening to sermons on the subject of ethics? Gary DeMar says the fall of the human race was over ethics. God's issue with the human race is not primarily moral. Yes, God hates sin. God tells us not to sin. He gives us very clear guidelines on what sin is. But actually, if you have understood what I've said so far, you realize that man's morality, even in sin, comes out of something that's there first, and that's an ethical system. It's not just doing good or evil morally. It's about defining good and evil ethically. So what, a Christian, what is Christian ethics? Now, there are many great men of God who teach this better than I do. Uh, some, are, and it's all worthwhile. If you find a good, solid Bible teacher that's doing a series on ethics, I would encourage you because this is one subject I don't really think you can get too much of. But for tonight's message, I, I went to a, a, a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German pastor theologian, who wrote a book called Ethics. It's not an easy read, I'll be honest with you. Uh, Bonhoeffer was uh, a genius, and sometimes when you read Bonhoeffer, you feel stupid. <laughs> but here, here, I'm going to give you a couple of profound statements. He says, the knowledge of good and evil is the aim of all ethical reflection. In other words, any time you're talking about good and evil, right and wrong, good and bad, you're talking about ethics. The next statement, he says, the first task of Christian ethics is to invalidate this knowledge. In launching this attack on the underlying assumption of all other ethics, Christian ethics stand so completely alone that it becomes questionable whether there's any purpose of speaking of Christian ethics at all. Let me come back to that first statement. He said, the aim of all ethical study is the knowledge of good and evil. And our first task is to invalidate this knowledge. What does he mean by that? He is actually telling us as Christians that we are to renounce the knowledge of good and evil. We are to do away with it. If we are walking in the Spirit in the kingdom, we must learn to say that I of myself have no knowledge of good and evil. I of myself, I have no idea of what's good and evil. I have no idea of what's right and wrong. Apart from God, I don't even know what it is. That is an amazing declaration, I believe, of humility and of our own inability to be God. Because the moment we say that we know good and evil, apart from God, we are acting like gods. We are actually putting ourselves in the position that only properly belongs to God. And then he goes on to say this, the Christian ethic repudiates all other ethical systems, since in one way or another, all the other ethical systems 
claim they do have a knowledge of good and evil apart from God. And this is what we have going on today in the American culture. We have leaders, we have movie stars, we have media outlets, we have celebrities, we have authors, we have thinkers, scientists, philosophers, who all, in one way or another, have their own knowledge of good and evil and teach it or preach it to us. And the Christian response is almost invisible. Because the Christian knows that even the subject of Christian ethics makes no sense apart from the revelation of God. Bonhoeffer goes on to make the point that for the Christian, there is no meaning or knowledge or true understanding of anything apart from God. He says, Christian ethics claims to discuss the origin of the whole problem of ethics and thus professes to be a critique of all ethics simply as ethics. Man at his origin knows only one thing. Man in the beginning knew only one thing, God. It is only in the unity of the knowledge of God that he knows other men, other things, and of himself. He knows all things only in God and God in all things. The knowledge of good and evil shows that he is no longer at one with God, at one with his origin. Now, let me, let me make sure I'm clear on this. God is not opposed to us knowing what is good and what is evil. He's not opposed to you and I knowing right from wrong good from bad. He's not, a, he's not opposed to bad. He is opposed to us acquiring that knowledge from any other source but God. See, in the beginning, it was like God made everything, everything was good. And we'll get into the thing about, well, well why did he make a tree of knowledge of good and evil? If everything he made was good, listen, we'll get into that some other time. The point I'm making, though, is that, that, that God was going to inform them by revelation of good and evil, right and wrong. If you get your knowledge of good and evil from any place else, then you are no longer at one with your origin which was from God. Thank you. One person got it. Hey, listen, uh, it, this is okay. I understand this is, this is fresh ground for some. It's okay. But it, it's, it's so powerful. That last line, the knowledge of good and evil shows he's no longer at one with his origin. Anyone who claims to know good and evil apart from God has proven that they are separated from God in an ethical sense. Because the knowledge of good and evil does not come from man. It can only come from God. Hang on for this one. I believe that unless there is a God, good and evil do not even exist. The only reason there is good and evil is because there is a God. Dr. William Craig from Talbot Seminary says, I think that we cannot truly be good without God. Because without God, good and evil, as such, do not exist. Without God, we cannot be good. But neither can we be evil without God. In the absence of God, everything is relative. Moral values just become personal expressions of taste. That is so profound, and this is one of the reasons we make the notes available to you on the on all the websites. And because I, I understand, if this is new, you might want to print the notes out, get the scriptures, the quotes, because some of these things 
require a little bit of chewing in order to, to digest them <laughs> properly. But, but that, that is so profound. If there's no God, there's no standard. Everyone is like the book of Judges. Every man does what is right in his own eyes. If there's no God and no objective standard outside of man, then every man becomes a God. Every man becomes his own ethical definer. Or as the famous quote from the Russian author Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, everything is permitted. If there's no God, there are no fixed laws. There's no absolute truth. There's nothing but new value systems made up in the ever-changing minds of men who forget what Randall Niles said, moral values are discovered, not invented by humans. You don't invent ethics. You don't invent the knowledge of good and evil. You don't just come up with your ideas of what those terms mean. And the American Christian community needs to repent of its complicity with world systems that seek to save us with new value systems that replace God's. C.S. Lewis once said, the human mind has no more power of inventing a new value than of imagining a new primary color, or indeed, of creating a new sun and a new sky for it to move in. The key thing here is by what standard is, is there, and the Christian world, the biblical worldview is that there is an objective standard of ethics, there is a knowledge of good and evil given by God through revelation. And the wise believer is willing to abdicate his place on the ethical throne and say, apart from God, I don't know anything about good and evil. Oh, that we could come to the day where we say, I don't know what's bad and good except by revelation from God. I have to look to God. Only he has the right to tell me what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. I dare not take his place or allow any politician to take his place or any philosopher, let alone Hollywood star. Heaven help us. You see, human ethics and morality are subject to change. God's ethical principles are not. An example, up to a few years ago, every state in the union had a law prohibiting the practice of sodomy or homosexuality. These laws were based on the Christian ethic. Today, Almost all of the same states have legalized sodomy, some even celebrated. And the truth is, you'd be surprised how many states still have a law against sodomy and, and homosexuality. They just don't enforce it. But the question is, what has changed? It wasn't the immorality. That's been with us. It's the ethics of those who pass the laws. That system has changed. But making immorality legal does not change its nature. Here's another sacred cow we need to kill. Dr. John Stevenson said we get the wrong idea that if something is legal, it's ethical. Well, there's a, you know, I can do this. 
there's a law that says I can do it, so it must be okay. But that is not the case. History has proven that we can legalize unethical things. Here are three Supreme Court legal decisions that were unethical. In 1857, in Dred Scott, the Supreme Court ruled that African Americans are not protected by the Constitution. That decision even questioned if whether or not they were human. That was overturned, of course. 1973, Roe v. Wade legalized abortion. But legalizing it didn't make it right. And that's been overturned. In 2015, in Obergefell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court recognized same-sex marriages. What happened? Well, let's believe that will be overturned. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That, I'm just saying that some people believe if the Supreme Court says it, it must be moral, must be ethical. That's not true. All of this proves the point that you cannot separate religion from politics because you can't separate legislation from morality. Somebody is going to decide what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, moral and immoral, and they will pass laws accordingly. Another sacred cow is you can't legislate morality. I've heard Christians say this. Say, well, Christians don't need to be in politics and worried about laws. And I mean, after all, you can't legislate morality. What they're saying is just because you pass a law doesn't mean people's behavior is going to change. Well, duh. Nobody is saying that. But the point you need to remember, and you need to remember this, is that all laws legislate morality. Why is the speed limit out here? 45 miles an hour. Do you ever think about that? See, if you have a biblical worldview, you think about stuff like that. You go, 45 miles an hour. Somebody decided that exceeding 45 miles an hour on this on this roadway is immoral. It's going to endanger people. It's going to be a problem. Somebody decided that. Now I'm using something that's, that's not necessarily evil or good. I'm just trying to show you the principle is that all laws are passed by people who have an ethical system. If the Christian church is silent, if we have no voice, if we will not take a stand and speak up for a biblical ethic, then we are basically turning the country over and making ourselves willing to have good and evil defined by non-believers. And this is exactly what's going on in our country. When you have a nation in a moral meltdown, you need to understand, know what to do. I've been praying for a long time that God would raise up a generation of Issachar anointed people, like 1 Chronicles 12:32. The sons of Issachar understood the times to know what Israel ought to do. You see, you can't know what to do until you understand the times. And you can't properly understand the times without a biblical worldview. Because the world is not what the New York Times says it is, or even Fox News. The world is what it is through the, the lens of Scripture as God sees it. And what's wrong with it is as God sees it. It's, 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 you know, everybody has a cure for America. And it ain't to give us all electric cars. And it's not going to fix us. 
And it's certainly not going to fix us to keep passing trillion dollar legislation bills that increase inflation and don't help anybody. But our nation is in a moral meltdown. I'm, I'm closing here. Let you out early tonight. Aren't you glad? Somebody said, let me up, let me up. The moral meltdown in America tells us too many Christians have no biblical worldview on ethics and morality. God's people need to repent of our own knowledge of good and evil and follow the model of Jesus. You know, I'm going to give you three scriptures all from the Gospel of John. And I, you, I've read these many times, but when I was preparing uh, this, this teaching, I realized what a powerful illustration it is of what I'm trying to, to say to you. Because even Jesus, even though he was God in the flesh, refused to offer his own opinion on ethics. In John 7, 15, Jesus said to them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. In John 8, 28, 29, he said, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father has taught me. And in John 14, 10, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative. But the Father abiding in me does his works. Now, if you analyze those things, those three sayings, and there are others, but I just wanted to give you those quick ones. Jesus came as God in the flesh to model what life ought to be like. He is the one that we are to model. And even though he was God, and we're not, we're sons of God, even Jesus when it came to issues of ethics and right and wrong, never claimed to speak on his own. He never, he never claimed or spoke as the one who was giving his own opinion. Now, there there's, uh, raises a question of, well, could he? Could he do otherwise? I don't know. I just know what he was saying there is something we all need to learn to say. And here's how it works. And let me close with this thought, because this is very practical. When it comes to the ethical issues of the day, and we all know what they are, because they're all in the news. When it comes to, I'm not talking about speed limits, I'm talking about moral issues, ethical issues. About any subject, to have a biblical worldview means that you lay down your own right or your own thoughts about defining what those ethics are. You will, you will not. For example, I said some things here about homosexuality. I've said some things about abortion. I've said some things about same-sex marriage. And frankly, some of the things have made people angry. Uh, some of the things have, you know, got me restricted on social platforms some people some have lost me some friends but i'm not speaking for me these are not my opinions if someone wants to know about homosexuality i don't pronounce my pronouncements based on what ray thinks i don't have my i, I do what the father has said what he's taught me by revelation, he has given me his word. And to know his word is to know his heart and to know his ethical system on any subject. 
because he speaks to every subject. I heard someone uh, just today, I can't even remember, some celebrity said, Jesus never said anything about abortion. Well, he never did directly address abortion, no. But he had an ethical position regarding children. He said, woe to those who harm these little ones. It'd be better for you if someone ties an anvil around your neck and throws you in the, in the, in the ocean than to harm one of these little ones. Well, last time I looked, a fetus is a little one made in the image and likeness of God. And so, when, you know, again, the Bible doesn't directly speak about same-sex marriage. But it does speak about same-sex relationships, sexual relationships. It does have something to say about that. Now, here's the point. Where's the church? When people are confronted with these issues, they're silent. They just let the world take the football and run it down the field across the goal line. They just accept the pronouncements of another ethical system whether it's the socialist, the Marxist, the communist, the, the, the radical left, anyone can just pronounce morality out of their ethical system and the church does not speak. And this is where we're falling short of what God has called us to be. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? This is, where, this is what we're called to do. We are called to bear witness to the truth. The New Testament says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Friends, the truth is not subjective. God's truth does not change. <clears throat> when God gives ethical pronouncements on morality concerning, say, the Ten Commandments, those haven't changed. They're not the Ten Suggestions. They're not the temporary, the ten temporary solutions. Those things are there, and they'll always be there, and they're truth, and they don't change. And God is needing, God is wanting to raise up a people who will take those positions and stand for them. And again, your, my, and your only proper position is to speak the revelation of God about moral ethical issues not our opinion it's not our the moment it's our opinion we've abdicated our voice and we've lost our authority because we're not speaking for us we're speaking for the one who made us and the one who loves us and what we need in the in, in the house of god is again a biblical worldview on everything including these these major questions about good and evil and right and wrong and good and bad. God help us to walk into that as his, as his people. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, tonight, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the instruction of the Holy Spirit on these grave matters as our nation is having a moral meltdown that we would be able to see from a heavenly perspective as a prophetic people and know that what's happening here is more than morality it's ethical it has to do with this whole knowledge of good and evil and Lord I pray you give us the grace to understand that we must take that position of renouncing the knowledge of good and evil apart from you that what you really forbade was independent knowledge when it comes to ethics and morality. You denied that to man. That was the only thing that you said would kill us. Standing in your place, making decisions out of our feelings, out of public opinions, forming our 
ethical positions based on what others are saying, especially our feelings. For Lord, we are a feelings generation in too many ways. And that we refuse what seems right to us. Your word says there is a way that seems right to a man, but by the ways of death. I'm thanking you right now there will be an awakening and a revival and a renewal of your church and your people in this country and, and uh, just a great groundswell of people who love you and trust you and look to you for the knowledge that only you can give us, the knowledge of good and evil. Help us for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Everybody breathing? <laughs> Hallelujah. We love you so much.